All right, let's look at the big monitor. So eventually we got that one set up. And we have about three weeks to work on the balancing car. That's the second time I'm, I'm doing that with a student in this class. So the first time was kind of successful, but not, I didn't get a complete product from that. So I think hopefully you guys can uh, polish it. So I'm gonna give you guys all the code I have uh, from anyone. Part of the from Jesse and his partner uh, James last time. Um, you know the first the first time when we did it last year, uh, we got a balancing robot and it worked. So there was a, a remote controller, the same one you have been using, a joystick, and it is able to balance on the floor. And when you uh, are trying to move it using the uh, joystick, it moves and at the same time balance as well. So the tasks have been changed slightly this time. <clears throat> so if you click part tool and scroll down to the very bottom, and you can see all the tasks, all right? And this course project takes 40% lower room rate. So be serious about it. I know, you know, you guys are getting good grades. I'm just, <laughs> you got tutorial. It's just I make good tutorials for full, right? <laughs> Follow, I'm done. And did you learn anything this lesson? Do you like the <laughs> yeah, <I know>. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Uh, so task one. I have a simplified version. So this is this is the one I because the one posted on the original author's website is super long and not really uh, clear. So I simplified it and just take the the core of the algorithm and uh, it's verified and it works. But I need to integrate the remote, the, the joystick into the code. Um, so which means it is only able to calibrate the angle and eventually you, uh, so you have to hold it at a 90 degree angle to let it calibrate, to calculate from the accelerometer and gyroscope data. And then you do not hold it anymore, it is still able to stand on the floor, and that's it. So that's the core algorithm of the entire thing, the PID controller. And you have to add your uh, remote control data into it. So it's not just a standing on the floor, but also can move back and forth and turning left and right. So that's uh, but the first task. If you read this one, it should be balanced on the flat surface, and you place the water bottle on the top of the car, it should still be there, you know, still be balanced. And if you push the car forward and backward, um, the car is gonna move, but still balanced, right? Won't tip over. So that's task one, which is 20 points, okay? And task two, <clears throat> add the joystick to the system, so the car should be able to move forward, backward, turn on left and right, enter the control of the remote, another 20 percent uh 20 points it's totally 100 100 points for the, the course project okay. task three pass the ramp test um i mean i i don't want to directly give you an angle right now for the, as a constraint since i don't know if it's going to work or not so 10 degree what about that I have seen some examples on YouTube. It is able to go up like 60 degrees. So I think it should be doable, but based on the performance of your car. Uh, let's start with 10 degree. Make it up for now. <laughs> okay, so to pass task three, the car has to be able to start from the flat surface and uh, going up and going down and then come back. Okay. So that's 60 points here and then PCB design fabrication soldering testing uh, you need the two boards two PCBs 
So task one to task three, they are not teamwork. You have to do it by yourself. So everyone, it is different from the uh, last time we were doing that. So I have I had uh, uh, two students in uh, on one team uh, to work on one car project. But this time it's going to be one car for each of you. So I have to make it work by yourself. I mean, I definitely, you can collaborate. You can ask questions. Um, but you have to get the car, your car, to work. Okay, to get the points, the credits. Uh, but task four is not. No, task four is not. You can find a person that you can you can work with, and you probably have uh, four different designs, like two designs for uh, each car, a remote PCB, and also the PCB board for the car, right? So for each car, it has two PCB boards. And you start working with a, a partner, and that person probably has a design for the remote and a design for the car as well. Um, you can fabricate four of them and test which one works eventually, but also you can have a meeting to discuss which one you're fabricating. It's only five dollars. I don't care. I mean, if you want to make four of them, which is fine. I mean, but it's the teamwork. Um, you don't have to do all different designs. Um, but you cannot just directly, for example, someone already made the piece of work or already tested. You're just asking like, can we be a on the same same team so I can directly use your board? <laughs> so that won't work. Um, okay, and then. So the purpose of the uh, task of four is, I, I think, uh, it's going to be a, a little bit too much work for one person to get two PCBs and solder and test it. Okay. Um, if you have a partner, you can, you know, split the tasks. For example, you are working on the remote, and the other one is working on the the cars, because the circuit is not changing at all. You know, you, you have been working on the controllers. You know that after you build up all these interface with the uh, CPIOs. Um, you, you don't have to modify the circuit too much. Right? They are already there. <laughs> Simple. Task five, final testing presentation and report writing. It's a teamwork. Uh, and the final presentation is on the final exam day. I think that works. Is there any issues if I do it on the final exam day? So we don't have a final paper exam. I, I, I used to have a final exam, a midterm exam for, the, for this class, but I don't think it I think it's wasting your time. It's better to just focus on the product. If I can, you know, get a card off from your guys as soon as possible. You know? <laughs> um, I haven't got I haven't gotten a functioning card by far. It's been a year. You know, it, it worked the last time, but it's just a prototype. Um, so this time I I will provide anything I have. So hopefully we can get a final product. And I didn't uh, did I put a three printing part in it? So probably not, but you do need some of the little parts to be printed. For example, the adapter to the, the tire. That's two parts here. And a battery holder, you know, you can hold the lipo battery and uh, something to hold the board. So the disadvantage of doing this breadboard here is whenever it's moving, because the accelerometer is super sensitive, it's gonna actually changing the, uh, the position of the mounting, the angle of the sensor on the board. You can see it's like shaking, you can even change, it, change the angle by matching that. So I highly recommend you that you solder this one to a little hider in the female hiders in the drawer. So solder that one to a prototype PCB. You can solder it on, a, on the PCB board. We are testing everything. And then plug this in, in, in that header. So it's not moving around like that. Um, but plugging everything into the prototype board uh, is the first round of tasks, which is fine. So if you want to just plug in here and do testing, so there are some of the little tiny tasks ask you to measure the angle. So whenever you change the angle to 90 degree, it should show that uh, degree change uh, in, in the serial monitor uh, continuously. So when you are doing these tasks, it's fine to plug in everything on the uh, prototype PCB board, or no, prototype breadboard. Uh, but when you are doing the testing for the 
financing the car or uh, right before the PCB fabrication, you'll probably want to solder this one to the uh, solder the hydra, plugging this one to the hydra on the prototype PCB. So it's not shaking so much. Um, so the map controller doesn't have to be at the bottom because eventually you are not using a um, development board for the, for the system. There's usually the DLS, right? You know, you know how to use a fireboard, a fireboard on the doors, the little caps. Um, so you are in my controllers, and you are not, but you can put that picture. It's super simple, right? Just an oscillator on the cap, 22 picopower cap, uh, and power on ground. That's it. So you, you program it still on, the, on this Arduino board. You program it and then take it out from there and plug into your uh, uh, circuit design on your drive board, right? Um, the reason that it looks messy here is because I don't have a, a customized PCB. If I have a customized PCB, I think the size of the PCB is probably only like this much. So you can imagine that um, you can directly mount the PCB on the top and the battery on the back of the top rack. And so the cable, the cables from the separate motor, you know, you can just pull it here and plug into the board. Uh, no, the board is here. So you can plug into the board on the top. And that's fine. Um, and eventually, I mean, I haven't put it on the, on the requirement yet, but, you know, this is definitely not a product. Um, I hope there can be a box on the top to, to hold that PCB inside, the 3D printed box. And also for the, for the remote control as well. I mean, I don't want to directly use, like, everything plugging to the drive board and all the wires, dumping wires. And you have to use your like another partner to hold the board <laughs> you are controlling, right? We want everything on the PCB, and the PCB is mounted in the 3D printed box. Just like a like product, like a toy, right? You can directly just grab the box, turn it on, and so you can play with it. If you guys don't do it, I have to wait for another year. Does it use us? Good deal. Okay. That's the last project we're going to do? Uh, this is a course project, but not the last thing. If you look at the schedule. There's another tutorial, service tutorial. I haven't uh, posted yet. Let's do ESP32 my controllers, but for two weeks. All right, so you can expect there might be at some point you are, you have to work on uh, both projects. You could not finish everything before this, uh, you know, after the third week. So I, I was thinking that you guys can finish up everything after the third week and then send the PCB design files out for fabrication. And, you know, Thanksgiving break, some companies, Chinese do not celebrate Thanksgiving, so which is fine, they will <laughs> fabricate more PCBs for you and send it back to you probably the first of December Okay, and you know, if everything has been tested on the prototype PCB and also on the breadboard, I think the PCB is gonna work. If it doesn't work, we'll just probably cut some of the wires and we make a jumping wire to make it work. Um, so you can test it, okay? Just do not, you know, move all the tasks of the uh, balancing car to the last two weeks because you, you are expecting another two weeks of new tutorials over there to finish. So be nice, trust me, you cannot focus on two projects at the same time. How that works, you can, can never work. You don't have one thing, you have two hands, and one voice, one core, like one thread or something. Too many parts or something? Too many parts? Clock. <laughs> and, um, Okay, so let's get into the tutorial and look at the details. How do we understand the code? <clears throat> so the beginning of the tutorial is not for you guys. 
you know, it's the general purpose to show to how to use a driver. I have done that in one of the homework. So I think your task starts from five, task five. But also there are some uh, useful information to uh, as a reference. For example, the schematic of the that So when you are designing your, because the accelerometer has to be mounted to your PCB. I have to think about it, right? So if your PCB is mounted horizontal on the board, then you have to design, you know, since I have been designing the PCB for the uh, accelerometer, module by myself. So that's a schematic of every single this little accelerometer module. And I just don't want to have a PCB board and then plugging that module, sensor module on, on, on the top of the PCB. It just looks like a bit awkward. It's taking a lot of space. I prefer like to integrate everything on one PCB. But in that case, the chip, so the sensor, which is a, a micro mechanical system, that's a little gyroscope, it's going to be horizontal, right? Not perpendicular to the board, which is fine. You just need to change the parameter in the code, right? It's a three axis accelerometer, right? Like that. Doesn't matter which one you are using, it's going to be the same, same uh, effect, right? So, do um, not use a module of MPU 60, uh, 6050. So, use this schematic and convert everything on your PCB. So it's a 3.3 volts component. I have to use a 3.3 volts regulator. I have a lot of these chips on my in, in the drawers. I think it's this guy, right? I have to design this guy, uh, not design this guy, but design a circuit for this regulator to uh, supply that serpent servos to the sensor. <clears throat> so these are three four. So for the um, for the directions of the car, so this is roll, right? Roll, pitch, and yell. Okay. So these are for the uh, gyroscope data. Angular velocity. Three three axes of the accelerometer, I think. Yeah, acceleration. And the, the y axis, since you can convert the LSB data into how many G's, gravity, how many G's. So if you hold it, you know, if I want to hold it like that, so one G. Yeah, I think the right one is 1G. So you are not going to get O0 right? because the gravity always exists. So one of the axes, no matter like which direction you are holding that uh, sensor, so one of the axes is going to show 1G if you hold it perpendicular to the, to the ground. That's what's happening over there. So X and Y doesn't have any acceleration, but Z has one G there. Yeah, 
Any questions regarding the calculation of the how many Gs? It's all on the data sheet. We have used, I've been doing this in my controllers, right? And also one of the homework assignments you have done that. So the the uh, the data you take out from the register in the sensor from the I2C protocol is in how many LSBs? Okay. And there's one here, which So if I select AFS as a selection, so the AFS selection, if I give a one to that uh, bit in the register, then the full scale range is plus minus four G. That's a range, full range that a shadow meter can can sense, and that's how you calculate it. That's the sensitivity of it, right? So you can. So data is how many LSBs, and you divide it, divide that number by uh, A192, you can get how many Gs you have in there. So it's very close to 1G, if you look at, you know, these values. Um, are some errors, but very close to 1G, if you hold it uh, in one, one of the axes is perpendicular to the ground. But you know, I cannot make it perfectly perpendicular to the ground. That's why there are some errors, but very close to 1G. Yeah, one more thing, don't forget that, which is reset. Okay? Always have this reset uh, in the setup function. So it is able to start doing a measurement is required and so the acceleration data has how many bits a quick question per axis how many bits Per axis. Huh? No. 16. It's six. It's XL, XL. So they actually combine the two things that are different. So for that, we have A here, A here. They have to combine them together. If you do not combine them together, just the final numbers, they don't know like which one is which one is the higher or higher. So which one is more or higher. So the sensor only has one uh, ICO, which is ICT protocol, right? It's printing bits. So to, since you know that, the first eight bits are, they'll start from 3D as the address of the register. So what is 3D? What's the address? Zero, zero, one, one. One zero one zero, right? Yeah, sorry. Because you don't know what I'm <laughs> Sure. <laughs> so what is three? Three B is the three B is the hack number, right? So three represents four binary bits. So it's gonna be zero zero one, right? So B is a line. It's A time. 11. 11 is 8 plus 3, so it's going to be 1011. Right? Sure. So 3 B is an 8 bit address for that register, for that memory. That will play the address first, like just tell the sensor, like, 3 B, I need a data from this address. Then 
when's the start sending that is it from the memory inside the sensor? Start streaming that bit. A bit. Boom, boom, boom. Yeah, a bit. Followed by this other request. There are just a bits, right? Just you know that. There are the upper half of the system to data for the acceleration. So I have to keep getting another edges, a bit, and then put them back uh, to the lower half of the 16 bit number data for the acceleration. But these a bits are have to be shifted to the left by a time. Does that make sense? That would make sense. Does that make sense? So, for example, imagine that. I have a 16-bit memory, all right? I plug in the first 8 bits here from the LSD to the 7, to the 8 bit. But I know that these are not, these bits shouldn't be there because they belong to here. So I have to shift them. Boom. Right? I'll try to shift them. These bits become what? Zero. Zero. You have to adjust zeros. And now I get a new data, which is the lower eight bits. And I'm going to combine them together. So all zeros here. The lower half, all zeros. And I have data here. I just want to combine them and combine here into one 16 bit data. Four, right? It's four. Why? Because zero or anything is still that thing. So I have that new data, all zeros. If I four them bit by bit, then I'm going to plug in all the data into here. Same for this part. Okay? So. That's how it combine the two A bits and make it about 16 bit data for the X axis acceleration. Same concept for Y and G, right? Is that how you can get the acceleration data? So if you look at the, the uh, script, see here? That's how that works. So what is 3B? What is 3B? 3B is the start of the acceleration data. Here, the address here. Right? So start reading data from there. Start reading data from there. And request for 16 bits instead of 8 bits. Two bytes are 16 bits. I have to write this address to the sensor first to let the sensor know I'm going to request the data from this, uh, this address. And then stop the transmission and then start over again. Request from MPU. What is MPU? I already defined it, claim it, which is the address of the I2C device. Um, you know, this represents like 3C or something. I mean, it doesn't matter. It's just a constant address of the I2B device. Request from that sensor two bytes starting from here. So you can get the X axis value, 16 bits in total. How? See? It's sending eight bits um, each time. So if you do a word dot read, it's going to. Um, return 8 bits and then or another read they are reading 2 bytes and you have to or them after you shift them 8 bits to the left so read the first byte and after read it shift all the bits to the left by 8 bits and then or the new lower 8 bits you can combine them together to So no problems with 
reading acceleration data is the same concept. So all the gyroscope, gyroscope is giving you the uh, angular velocity, which is how many how many degrees per second. And so these data are are also in LSPs, and you have to do it the same same thing to read the first byte and shift to the left by eight bits, and then or the new eight bit. Uh, to get that uh, full 16-bit data. Let's scroll down and take a look at that. So we're looking at this, this is acceleration data, okay? And do some testings with this. All right, this is doing a um, averaging five data points. Okay, so this is just for calibration. Another concept over here, loop time, uh, loop timer variable. The PID controller has, uh, it creates three different uh, components and you have to add them together. Some of them can be negative or positive, doesn't matter, but you have to add the uh, proportional integral and differential components of the controller together. And so the uh, core vari uh, variable here is the uh, error, okay? And because um, if you do not have a loop timer set up for the loop, so every time it runs at a different, uh, different time period for the loop, then you are getting a different delta t all the time, which is bad. You want the same delta t. Um, it's not difficult. So for the uh, PID, very simple, just times the error and add them together. It's very easy to implement in the code. And you have to get the error first because the error is being used as a variable in these equations. Um, and now the difficult part is delta t, okay? How can I get a good delta t every time? And here's a way to do it. It takes a few seconds for you guys to understand how how this works. I have to start at it and <laughs> keep thinking and trying to simulate everything in your, in your mind. <clears throat> so that's a setup function. Doesn't matter what's in there, okay? But you have to plug in this line at the very bottom of the setup function. So that's a variable. That's a, a time. After, it's like a timer. It returns a time after you start up your Arduino. That for example, I, I started up. It doesn't matter what's happening afterwards. So this one is a timer. It's going to show you. It's going to return. How long it's been running, and the value as a unit is microseconds. Yeah, keep running it cannot stop it unless it's a part of it. So that's for solvent because this is in microseconds, so you got plus a plus four thousand to it. Then uh, it's adding four thousand microseconds to it. Then I start actually trying to set up the the loop function afterwards. I want to set up that function. To be executed for 4,000 microseconds each time. Let's see how, how we can do that. <clears throat> so that's a loop function. It doesn't matter what's happening at the very beginning of the loop function, actually, it's very low. So at the very bottom of the loop function, you want to have these two lines over there. And then uh, you can accurately set up the entire loop because after the setup function, to so keep running the loop function all the time, which is the delta t. So we can uh, make this function from here to here to be 4,000 microseconds in the future. But why does that work in that way? Why? So let's look at this diagram. So remember, in the setup function, we had right connected, ready. 
Mm -hmm. Doesn't have a good connection. Uh, it doesn't even allow me to connect to it. So if you can open up the web page <coughs> and uh, look at the diagram, This diagram is a white background one. Uh. So the startup function, whenever you start a program, the microseconds that function will return zero, right? And after it runs to the end of the setup function, it's going to return a time. And you don't know what that is, but which doesn't matter at all. Because if you look at, um, because you, the, the setup function has a looper, looper, uh, loop timer, the microseconds plus 4,000, and it's assigned, it's being assigned to the uh, loop timer variable. And so the loop timer variable is going to change, uh, keep changing because the microseconds is changing over time. Is that correct? And the loop timer was added to for microseconds plus 4,000. And then um, the first time it runs through the loop function, it's going to compare the microseconds. So the microseconds function is going to change. It's always uh, timing until the end of the loop function. And when that, if that one is smaller than the loop timer variable, which means it's uh, so the loop function is not reaching 4,000 microseconds yet. I mean, does that make sense? It's probably not. Uh, I mean, so look at that one and see if you can understand that right now. It's going to take time for me to like explain that all the time. Four, five. Okay, that works. Eventually, remember I just mentioned this one is going to keep timing, won't stop, right? It's going to tick him up. So let's just think about this. This uh, entire function is being executed for the first time. The first time it's being executed right now, okay? This guy started. So it starts from here and runs from here. So this one has a time. It's already taken from 30 seconds. Okay, so this one is going to return that. And those plus 4,000 microseconds, the, the reason you want to put that at the bottom is if you want to record this time at that moment. 
So you know the price of food. Uh, all the cell phone. Okay? Is there everything in the size of the power that, that variable? And that one won't change at that moment. After that moment because this one will keep changing, but this one won't change. And with the future, this one right here, assign to that one as the name of the final function. Okay? This is still the first time it's right disconnected. I don't know how to fix it anyway. So we are going to do the, everything in in 2771 next time on Wednesday. So um, look at the loop function. Let's scroll down to the loop. Just from that part, and you can see uh, right below it is a loop, right? The loop function with uh, that's part one, part one of the future for loop. Yeah, did you see that one? Uh, no. Yeah. So yeah, about that. So now look at the loop function. Now, let's think about that. If, if that one makes sense, okay? So the loop function is right after the setup function. Okay, remember the setup function already assigned everything to the loop timer variable, and which recorded, you know, the time spent on the uh, setup function plus four thousand microseconds, right? So now, <clears throat> after the top part of the loop function has been executed, it reaches the bottom bottom two lines, and the while well function. It's going to compare the current microseconds. It's a current microseconds. It's not a, the previous microseconds anymore. It's the current microseconds. If that one is smaller than loop timer, so what is loop timer? The, it's still the first time it executes the, the entire code. Okay. So what is in loop timer? The loop timer is a microsecond plus 4,000 microseconds, right? Okay. Yeah. So the micro, the previous microseconds plus four thousand microseconds, which is the time spent for the setup function plus four thousand microseconds. Okay. And if the current time is less than that, then you just want to hold there. Don't do anything else. You wait until it doesn't satisfy that condition, which means it reaches what? Reaches where? So, so whenever it doesn't satisfy that condition, that means the loop function has been executed and waiting there all the way for how long? So the current variable, which is micro micros, is larger than the loop time. The loop time, we are still talking about the first time it runs the entire code, right? Still the first time. Since you know whenever you turn, turn on uh, Arduino, it runs a setup function for once and then keep running the loop, right? So we are still talking about the first time it runs the setup and run the loop. So after it runs that setup, at the end, you want to record it because you want to know how long the setup function spent or takes. Okay, the, the, the way you record it is you call that microsecond function and then you plus 4,000 uh, microseconds. So the 4,000 microseconds set up the whole range for the loop function. But the microseconds record that time point which has been you know, uh, spent by the setup function. And you assign everything to the loop timer variable. Okay. So that variable holds the uh, setup function's time plus 4,000 uh, 4, microseconds. And then it reaches the bottom two lines of the loop function. And you have a while condition there. So while, um, and then you call the microseconds function again, which will show you the current time. OK? 
okay? The current time. So the current time contains whatever has spent for the setup function and whatever has spent for the root function until that point, okay? So that one has to be keep ticking, you know, you know, wait until it reaches the setup function plus for thousand microseconds. So you know that the loop function has been running there for four thousand microseconds. Does that make sense? Do not or and or okay. make sense? Kind of. But read it if you if that makes sense for you for now. And then you add for because next time you're going to keep running that loop function again. So directly add whenever that one is done, the well condition is done. You add 4,000 microseconds to the root timer variable again. So next time it's going to compare to the new root timer variable, which has 4,000 more microseconds. So we can kind of guarantee that every time you run the root function, it's going to, it's going to take 4,000 microseconds. If it's not, it's weak. Right. And how to measure the angle? How to measure the angle? Scroll down to the car. The car is drawing, it's not a car, it's just a circle. Probably lying. How to measure that angle? There are two ways to, to do it. First, the deceleration. Like, I, I, as I just mentioned, you know, the um, if you kick one of the axes perpendicular to the ground, then that direction, the acceleration on that direction will be 1G, okay? So once, once the angle changes, so you can measure the acceleration for the horizontal value, and then do an A sine function, no, actually, it doesn't matter because a sine or a uh, tangent, they're going to give you a, a very very similar result because um, the angle change will be small, and you get the two ac uh, two acceleration data, and you do an a sine um, function, and you can get the angle. Does that make sense? Any questions on that one? Okay, so angle can be acquired by using that function, a sine function. Zero scope, the zero raw data. If you scroll down to the zero raw data table, So again, the 16-bit gyroscope data is in LSBs, okay? And that LSB data uh, shows the, uh, shows, uh, um, you have to use whatever showing on the table to convert into the angular velocity, so which means how many degrees per second, okay? Um, still the same thing, you can, you can configure the registers of FS selection bit. Uh, you can use different values here. I think, I believe it's a two bit selector uh, to pick up which one you want to use. Uh, and so it has, has different ranges uh, of the uh, full scale, full scale ranges. And after you get that one, you know which row in the table you want to use and you can convert the LSB data into angular velocity, okay? But here's a question. Angular velocity is not, ang is not angle. But we are trying to get angle. The angle is, a, is a, um, the input. And we have to cut because when the car is perpendicular to the ground, the angle actually is zero, ideally. And whenever it has an angle here, it is able to sense it and use whatever the, the equations on the website is using to calculate the angle. And if it's moving forward, the tipping forward, then you want to roll, you sense the angle and roll your tire to the front direction 
to adjust the, 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 the angle. Okay? But overall, we still have to get the angle data first. But the general scope is giving you the angle, angular velocity, not the angles. So how do you solve that problem? It's a, it's a discrete system, it's not an analog system. So it um, calculate for the gyroscope, for the angular velocity, every loop. And we already defined the loop time to be 4,000 microseconds. So something like 4,000 microseconds, boom. 4,000 microseconds, 4,000 microseconds. And for every 4,000 microseconds, you get one gyroscope data. Okay, one, 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 one. So we have a delta t here. Okay, I got one point here, one point here. I got a delta t. So angular velocity is how many degrees per second? Since I got a t here, I have the t here. I just times with the t, which is four thousand microseconds, times that angular velocity, so I can get the angle change. Okay. All right, so that's everything for tutorial one. Um, I mean, I think most of you have everything, and so you are ready to start with testing. If not, just let me know if I can try to find out the, the components in the lab for you guys. And I only have, I think, uh, three or four of these car frames. I think uh, for me, why should one but <laughs> um, you can uh, just want an A student in this one. I want a three for three. So what about that? It's, you guys just need a blue one. Okay. Or for each of you. You can, you can, you can refer to the frames like measure it, how long you want the the uh, uh, post to be and how big the force will be. Um, but just make you one for yourself. So contact the uh, Sizer. In a lab manager, the lab manager, Molina, and see if he can help uh, cut all these boards for you. I have materials, I have all these threads as well. Does he know already the right materials to use? I have the raw material. So he, he knows that. It's very, uh, he knows what materials to use for us, for us, for this. Yeah, I, I can give it to you. I do just bring it to him. Right. To ask him to, to cut it. Okay. Work. I'm gonna try to organize the labs. Uh, maybe today, tomorrow, and try to throw the materials somewhere in the labs for you guys. And um, do you have the files for the 3D parts that we need to print? I don't. I may have from from James. Any questions? No. Okay. But I think I still have some some uh, remaining stuff to cover. I think let's go to twenty seven seventy one next time. Did you record it? Friday. Oh, uh, record it. Yeah. Did you record this one? I I did, but that's not really smooth. You know. Yeah, let's let's do it. Let's do it over there. Friday. Ah, frustrating. Yeah. <laughs>